So I want to welcome you to our program today. Um, apparently, this particular subject is of uh, great interest. We had a lot of people registering for this program today. I think there's a theme this week. We seem to be talking about neuropsychiatric issues and Parkinson's. If you joined us yesterday, we were talking about psychosis and dementia. Um, and today we're going to be talking about mood and emotional dysregulation in Parkinson's. And this is actually one of two parts that we're going to be uh, covering neuropsychiatric issues with Dr. Pontone. Um, today we're focusing on mood in regards to uh, depression and uh, apathy. The next time we're going to be talking more in terms of anxiety. So hopefully you'll join us for both of those. Um, I'd love to invite you to open up your chat box and that's where the questions will be. Um, place those throughout the conversation today and we'll answer those at the end and give us a shout out. Let us know where you're joining us from. And then because you guys are uh, probably all veterans, hopefully uh, you're all veterans. And if you're not and you're new to PMD Alliance, I welcome you and glad that you're joining us. Um, I just wanted to let you know that normally we have a full hour program, but Dr. Pontone has a little bit of uh, life to live and, and a child to get from school. And so we're going to give him a little time grace uh, so he has time to fill that role in his life. And so we're going to be ending a few minutes early today, but he assures me that he's got a lot to cover. He's going to get through all of it. And so I am going to go ahead and introduce him to you and then let him get this kicked off for you. Um, so Dr. Pontone, um, he's been on our NeuroLife alum before, I believe, uh, with the holistic with Dr. Supermanian. Um, he is the director of the Johns Hopkins Parkinson's Disease Neuropsychiatric Clinic, which focuses on diagnosis. Diagnosing, diagnosing and treating neuropsychiatric aspects of Parkinson's disease and related disorders. And he has research focused on the interaction between neuropsychiatric symptoms such as cognitive impairment, anxiety and depression and motor impairment in Parkinson's disease. So he is going to be, as I said, talking about some of these mood issues and emotional dysregulation. So Dr. Pontone, thank you for joining us and I'm going to let you take it from here. Thank you so much and thank everyone uh, for coming today to, to be with us and spend most of an hour uh, hopefully learning some things that are new and uh, validating some things that you already knew. And so really what I want to focus on today is how mood and emotional regulation can be affected by Parkinson's disease. And uh, you know, before I start, I always like to tell you that um, I don't have any relevant financial relationships with commercial interests uh, regarding the content of this talk. So everything should be above board and evidence-based uh, in terms of the science that supports it. I do uh, some consulting for Acadia Pharmaceuticals, but on a topic that is not uh, relevant to this talk. And so by the end of today, what I really hope everyone can do is sort of recognize the presentation of mood issues in Parkinson's disease, sort of be able, being able to differentiate what is normal emotional experience from an emotional experience that might be due to the biology of Parkinson's or another process. And when you recognize that it's something other than normal to get the appropriate evaluation and care. And I think uh, hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll appreciate why that's so important and how it can really lift your quality of life rather than suffering needlessly. I, I wanna talk about how the physical and biological aspects of Parkinson's might be associated with these mood issues because one of the things that is really nasty about depression and other mood changes, whether you have Parkinson's or not, is that you tend to blame yourself because you can't understand why you're not doing as well as you should and, and frankly, you're capable of doing. And so when you understand that these are biologically caused and not your fault, you know, not a character weakness, I think that can really help you uh, sort of cope with these things better and you know, hopefully lead you to seek the appropriate care. And then finally, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the recommended strategies and I'm gonna do this in two ways. So one is, you know, I'm going to tell you what you can do, right, on your own independently. 
The second is I'm going to at least mention so that you'll be familiar with the treatments that are available through your uh, doctors and providers, okay? Uh, we don't need to go into detail, but so at least when you hear how they might approach them, you're, you're comfortable. Now, the first thing I like to start with is an overview of mood issues and Parkinson's because hopefully you'll appreciate how the two things are intertwined. So I'm gonna tell this in two different ways. I'm gonna start talking about Parkinson's, but then I'm gonna finish this segment talking about what we know about depression and other mood disorders. And then hopefully by looking at both of them, you'll see where they connect, okay? Now, most of the time when we talk about Parkinson's disease, we're focused on a particular area of the brain, okay? And that's the midbrain. And then specifically within the midbrain, we talk about something called the substantia nigra, the black substance. And the reason that's important is that the majority of neurons that uh, control movement uh, live there. And they control movement in part by the way they secrete dopamine, okay? And they die off when you have Parkinson's. When you lose uh, a certain amount, we think it's somewhere between 60 and 80% of these dopamine producing neurons, you start to have the movement symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And so that's the first part of the story is this loss of dopamine. And we all know that dopamine is important uh, in, in regard to the movement symptoms of Parkinson's because how do we improve the movement symptoms? We give you dopamine replacement in various ways. The thing we don't talk about as much is the role of dopamine in other aspects of our lives and not just in Parkinson's. So for all of us, Dopamine is one of the key mood regulating chemicals in the brain. Okay. It's, it's all the reward or pleasure chemical. Oftentimes it's not the only one, but it's one of the main reward or pleasure chemicals. And so uh, when that's depleted, not only do we see movement problems, we see problems with mood and reward in the brain, but it gets, it's a little bigger than that. And this is the part of Parkinson's we often don't talk about. And this is that biological piece that I think hopefully gets people, you know, off the hook from blaming themselves or feeling like they're inadequate or they, they're not coping well, that this really is linked to the biology. It turns out that although we focus on the substantia nigra and the loss of dopamine, Parkinson's disease really affects a much broader uh, part of the brain, okay? It affects other nuclei, you know, small regions of the brain that have specific functions over the course of the disease. And believe it or not, some of these other regions are affected even before the dopamine containing regions. And so I'll, I'll show you how that plays out in people who don't even know they have Parkinson's yet. But the important ones are brain regions that produce serotonin and norepinephrine, because those are chemicals that are also important for the regulation of mood. So the RAFE nuclei, for instance, produce a lot of serotonin and they're affected by Parkinson's. The locus ceruleus produces a lot of norepinephrine and it's affected by Parkinson's. In fact, it's definitely affected before the substantia nigra. And in fact, in animal models, like mouse models of Parkinson's, if you destroy or lesion that locus ceruleus in a rat, and then you expose it to chemicals that cause Parkinsonism, the lesioned rats who don't have an intact locus ceruleus will develop Parkinson's more quickly and more severely than those who don't have a lesioned locus ceruleus. So you can see how these are all very connected. And so um, again, we know these three chemicals, there's more, but we know these three mood regulating chemicals are depleted in Parkinson's disease. And so now let me switch to telling you a story, a biological story about major depression. So this is major depression in people regardless of whether or not they have Parkinson's. So people with Parkinson's, people without Parkinson's, our primary hypothesis about the cause of depression is that it's caused by the depletion of what we call monoamines. And it's, this is called the monoamine theory. And it turns out that these monoamines are norepinephrine, serotonin, and dopamine, all the things that we know are already depleted in Parkinson's. And so just as you might guess, people with Parkinson's are 
much more likely to have depression than people without Parkinson's. And when they have depression, it tends to be pretty severe uh, because in addition to maybe having depression for another reason, they've also got a disease that takes away the chemicals. Now, these chemicals aren't the only cause. They're a major contributor. And the reason we know they're not the only cause is because the antidepressants that modulate these chemicals only work about half the time, whether you have Parkinson's or not Parkinson's. They only work about half the time, which means that at least one or two other things have to happen for you to have major depression. But we still know they're important. And so that's sort of where we go next. Remember I said that in Parkinson's, you might lose some of these other chemicals like norepinephrine and serotonin even before you start to experience a significant decline in dopamine. This is what this figure is showing. And let me explain it to you so you can put the pieces together. This figure is a, a sort of a representation of the life of many people with Parkinson's, a few hundred, okay? Um, and basically, uh, what it represents is time zero there on the horizontal line. We call that the x-axis. Time zero is the time at which they're diagnosed with Parkinson's. That's when you see the movement symptoms, okay? Everything to the left of that is before you even know or have been diagnosed with Parkinson's, and that's shaded in red. And everything to the right is after you have recognized or diagnosed Parkinson's disease, okay? And the height of each bar represents the number or proportion of individuals who have their first depressive episode, okay? And what's really interesting is you can sort of see that as they approach that time of onset of Parkinson's, the peak gets higher, meaning that more and more people are having their first depressive episode. And so what's going on here? In that left side, it could just be that these are people who have depression that's unrelated to their Parkinson's, but we're pretty confident that a lot of those people in red are people who have early undiagnosed Parkinson's changes in their brain, and they're starting to lose serotonin and norepinephrine, and then as they get closer to onset, they're losing dopamine, the three chemicals important for mood regulation, so that by the time they're diagnosed, the prevalence of depression in many people with Parkinson's is 50% or more. And so it, I, I just wanted to point this out to you because this is sort of the confluence of the loss of all of these chemicals, uh, not, not a failure of character, okay? And so that's, uh, that's where we wanna start is that we know the disease itself makes you more likely to experience changes in mood, okay? Now, let's talk specifically about depression and what it looks like, what it is and what it isn't, and how it manifests in people with and without Parkinson's, and then how you can distinguish the two, okay? So let's just start with depression. And again, this is describing a major depression, whether you have Parkinson's or you don't, okay? Now, what we call major depression is more than just sadness. It's a syndrome, okay? Meaning that it's a collection of several different symptoms that make you dysfunctional, okay? And so the ones we're most familiar with are depressed mood or sadness, but it turns out that there are many people who deny being sad yet still have major depression. And that's because even if you don't feel sad, if you have an inability or a decreased ability to enjoy things, we call that anhedonia. So that's the absence of pleasure. If you can't experience pleasure or you have a diminished ability to experience pleasure, that symptom alone, it can be a key symptom of depression, even if you deny being sad and you're not crying. But either of those, depressed sad mood or loss of ability to experience pleasure are sort of the key symptoms of a depressive illness. So if you have either one of those, plus at least four other symptoms, you meet the clinical criteria for a major depressive episode. And let me just run through some of these. And, and a lot of these you know, are intuitive. You would guess that a depressed person would feel this way. Depressed people often feel hopeless, helpless, worthless, or have inappropriate guilt. You know, Guilt that's either out of proportion to what they've actually done, or guilt about things they may have not even done. 
Sometimes the depression is so severe that people think life is no longer worth living and they may even have a plan or think about hurting themselves or killing themselves, okay? Uh, loss of energy is also a very common symptom of depression. Of course, if you have Parkinson's, it's a very fatiguing disease. So that can get a little um, uh, sort of confusing in terms of which do you attribute it to. And, you know, based on the biology I just showed you, Maybe it's a little bit of both, right? We're talking about a lot of the same chemicals. Sleep. Sleep is dysregulated in the majority of people who have a depressive illness. Now, most commonly, it's a loss of sleep. So people who have trouble sleeping, either falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking before they'd like. That's the most common. Although I will tell you that 10% or more of people are sleeping too much. And so these are the people who are, you know, kind of low on energy, sad or blue, and they might sleep all night and then sleep until lunch. So, you know, they're sleeping 12 or more hours in a day. So that's a, another way that depression can present. And in the same way, appetite can be affected. Most classically, it's decreased appetite. But some people, usually those same people who are sleeping too much, also eat too much. And when you have too much sleep and too much appetite, we often call that an atypical depression, because the more typical depression is loss of sleep, loss of appetite. But either way, if there's a, a dysregulation of sleep or appetite, that's consistent with the depressive illness. And then this is one that's really interesting. Depressive syndromes often, very often, impair your ability to concentrate or to sustain focus and slow down your processing. Uh, and oftentimes that makes you indecisive. So, you know, people, you know, mundane everyday decisions are agonizing for them. You know, they can't decide, am I going to wear loafers or dress shoes? Am I going to eat an apple or a pear? I mean, really simple things just be, you know, eat up their day. And so we, we often uh, screen for depression when we're screening people for changes in cognition because it can masquerade as a dementia sometimes, if it's very severe, and yet it's reversible. And then finally, and this is the one that to me is really interesting, you know, we're sort of talking about the crossover between what's Parkinson's, right, and what's depression. It turns out that even if you don't have Parkinson's, if your depression is really severe, it can retard your physical movements. We call that psychomotor retardation. I've seen people who take three seconds to answer a question. We call that speech latency because they're so slowed down because of the depression. And then in the same way, I've seen people so restless that they can't sit because they're so depressed, they're wringing their hands and pacing, okay? And you can see that in Parkinson's for other reasons. And so again, it's just a really interesting point of inter overlap potentially between these two diseases. But let me show you that overlap in a way that makes it sometimes difficult for the person with Parkinson's or their loved ones or even their doctors to tell whether they're depressed or whether it's just the Parkinson's. So first of all, because there's changes in facial expression due to Parkinson's, sometimes people say, well, you look sad. And they can say, look, I'm happy. You know, you just can't see it on my face. So that facial masking uh, can often confound the assessment of mood in Parkinson's. So you, you really just have to ask, you know, you can't assume that because their face has reduced expression that they're sad or angry or depressed. Um, the other thing that it, it can be a, a little bit confounding is that this lack of interest or participation in usual activities that represents the anhedonia, the loss of pleasure sense, can be mimicked by apathy, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And that's pretty common in Parkinson's. Up to a third of people with Parkinson's can have apathy. So you have to make sure it's not apathy related to Parkinson's. And in the same way, over the course of Parkinson's, people tend to lose weight. It's usually a gradual weight loss. But if it's all of a sudden, um, you know, uh, and not related to, you know, le nausea from levodopa or something like that, it could be more the, the depression than the Parkinson's. But you can see where there's multiple reasons people's appetite might change when you have Parkinson's. Uh, psychomotor agitation, that restlessness I described, it could be from depression. But in someone with Parkinson's, if you're near the end of dose and you're wearing off, you feel uncomfortable and you try to pace it off. I've seen many people near the end of dose who get uncomfortable and they sit and stand and pace because they can feel the dopamine leaving their body. Uh, low energy, as I mentioned, Parkinson's is a very fatiguing disease. 
Parkinson's also changes your cognitive function. You know, there's executive dysfunction in Parkinson's, and sometimes that can be confused with the changes that depression can bring. And then, you know, the one I tell people that if you see this, you know, go ahead and go right to a mental health care provider is that if you're having inappropriate uh, guilt, feelings of worthlessness, hopelessness, or helplessness, or thoughts of suicide, or that life isn't worth living, that's not Parkinson's, that's depression, and there's no ambiguity there. So there's a few symptoms that, you know, were pretty clear, belong to depression and don't overlap with Parkinson's. And so hopefully this is helpful when you're thinking about how to differentiate the two processes. Now, I want to briefly mention this because I think it's something that we don't often talk about in Parkinson's, but I can tell you as a psychiatrist, we talk about this all the time. Most people have what we call unipolar major depression, meaning that you have your normal mood and then you might experience an episode of depression where your mood goes low. And then when the episode's over, either because you spontaneously recover or you're treated with medications, you recover to this line. Now there are people, and there's fortunately, we think it's only two to 4% of the population who have what's called a bipolar illness. And so if this is the normal mood line, not only do they have depressive episodes, but they might have episodes where they go high. And we call those either hypomania if they're mild, or if they're severe, we call them mania. And let me promise you, they're significant. I, I mean, uh, when people use the term crazy, that's mania. You'll see things that don't make sense. And it's really unfortunate because this bipolar disorder, whether it happens in Parkinson's or people without Parkinson's, changes lives. It has a high mortality because of the things people do during the episodes and how they suffer over the course of the illness. And so the reason this is important in Parkinson's is because it turns out, remember that figure I showed you where people who had mood, you know, depression early in life, it might have been an early manifestation of Parkinson's. Well, we know people who have depressive episodes are at an increased risk, a twofold or greater increased risk of Parkinson's later in life. It turns out the same is true for bipolar illness. Whether you have a depressive episode or a manic episode, these people are at an increased risk for Parkinson's later in life. And so there's a connection between these two disorders. And more importantly, whether you have Parkinson's or not, if you treat someone with bipolar with an antidepressant and don't use a mood stabilizer along with it, you risk flipping them from a depressed episode into mania. And mania for most people is by far the more dangerous mood state. Okay, so I just want to mention this because it has a relationship to Parkinson's that I think we don't talk about, that it increases the risk of later Parkinson's by twofold, threefold, depending on the study that you have looked at. And I mean, this has been studied all over the world. The, probably the biggest is in Taiwan. They used, you know, a, a national database to look at this. And that treatment really needs to be different in bipolar compared to just vanilla unipolar depression because there's risks treating it the same way. And so here's um, just sort of, so you guys have this in the slide set and the, on the recording, I wanna show you a lot of what I just said uh, about the increased risk of Parkinson's and um, you know how this is uh, more likely if you have a family history of bipolar. Now, whether or not this is due to overlapping genes is still a bit murky, but I, I, we do think that's the case. And there's some studies uh, that are starting to show evidence of this. Now, let's go back to the much more common uh, unipolar depression and just talk about how often are we going to see this in Parkinson's. So I, I briefly mentioned that by the time of diagnosis and even early disease, you know, uh, uh, at least half of people with Parkinson's will have experienced mild or minor symptoms of depression, okay? And up to a quarter, 25%, will have full major depression, which definitely needs treatment. And often when you're depressed, anxiety goes along with it. And so you kind of want to look for both. So I, I just want to put this on your radar because literally if you're sitting in a room right now, if you're watching this with your support group, look to your left, look to your right. And you just looked at someone who's going to have depression based on this prevalence. Okay. Now uh, this has been, you know, fortunately we're, we're more and more aware of how important this is in Parkinson's and the Parkinson's foundation 
actually has a longitudinal study that's very big, you know, over 10,000 people with Parkinson's. And this is the take home for me, you know, as a, as a doctor treating people with Parkinson's. We do a good job of controlling the movement symptoms of Parkinson's. We have great medications that control the movement symptoms. And we have good antidepressants. If you treat depression, you're having a very big impact on quality of life. There, this longitudinal study I just mentioned found that the impact of depression on quality of life in Parkinson's is almost twice as big as the impact of the motor symptoms. So if you're depressed and you have movement symptoms, treating your depression is going to increase your quality of life more than if we simply treat your motor symptoms. So, you know, you should do both. Absolutely. But if, if for some weird reason you could only do one, it sounds like there's a bigger payoff just from treating the depression. So I don't, I don't want you to miss this, right? Because this, you know, this whole, any chronic disease, whether it's diabetes, high blood pressure, or Parkinson's, once you're controlling the symptoms to the best of your ability, the real strategy here is quality of life. You know, it's how, how well can I live? I mean, really as we age, that's what all of us are doing, right? Is how well can we live? And so this is an important message here that treating depression is very impactful for your quality of life and something worth pursuing. Now, let me show you another thing. So, you know, if, if quality of life is too sort of ambiguous and fuzzy for you, let me show you hardcore function, okay? And when I say function, and this is from a longitudinal study here at Hopkins that's entering its, I think, 24th year now, we published a paper, and let me just cut to the chase and show you the data, that when we looked at function, daily functioning, these are things like eating, bathing, dressing, walking, speaking. So very fundamental activities of daily living. We found that depressed people functioned less well than non-depressed people with Parkinson's, even with equal levels of motor impairment. Okay, so even with the same movement symptoms, if you were depressed, you functioned physically less well than people who weren't depressed. And we showed this over uh, a six year period. I know it's hard to discern that from this figure that looks like it goes from one to four, but there's two years between each visit with the first visit being the baseline. So two years in, in between each. And if you look, that green line is people who had never been depressed. So during the whole duration of the study, they'd never been depressed, okay? People on that red line, that's the lower line, that red dashed line, those are people who are symptomatically depressed, SD. And that blue line are people who had depression, but it remitted, it went away. And then that vertical line, the y-axis, it, it says NWDS, that's the Northwestern Disability Scale. And that is a scale that measures eating, dressing, bathing, speaking, walking, fundamental activities of daily living. And higher is better. Higher means you're more functional. And I hope what you can see is that, you know, Parkinson's is a progressive disease. So everybody, regardless of whether it's the green line, the blue line, or the red line, is declining over the course of the disease, but very gradually, right? Very gently. The difference is people who are depressed, that red line, they're fun functioning significantly less well at any point across that six-year period than people who are dep uh, aren't depressed. Okay, so whether you have never had depression or you had depression and it got treated, you're functioning better. And so our message to people is that you absolutely can improve your quality of life and function by treating your depression. Okay, and, and so that's that's the impact of depression and Parkinson's. Okay, now what can you do? Okay. Now these are things, you know, these aren't, again, these aren't fuzzy, um, soft things. These are, there's evidence to base this on, and there's more evidence emerging on how important these things are. Stay connected. So it turns out that being socially isolated and or lonely are as bad for your health as smoking cigarettes, having high blood pressure, or being obese. And you would say, how, how can being lonely be that bad for you? Studies have shown this even before the pandemic. Everybody says, oh, is this just pandemic studies? No, this is data. You can look on the World Health Organization websites. This is data that we knew before the pandemic. And then when the pandemic happened, we really got a, a taste of just how bad 
social isolation was on people's health. You heard of these people dying of causes other than COVID, not just because they weren't going to their checkups, directly due to being socially isolated. So this is really important. Even if you've never been a social person, make sure you stay connected. Find a network of friends, visit family, join groups, exercise in groups, okay? I can't tell you how important this is, and it's been under-recognized and under-reported, but it, I think, you know, through, you know, through talks like this, we're just going to keep hammering at home. It's really important, and frankly, once you get connected, it's really fun. I'm one of those guys who like, I'd live in a cave if I could, but I, I think I've come to realize that, you know, having a few friends is okay. And so hopefully, even if you've been sort of uh, a loner most of your life, try it out. You know, it doesn't have to be every day. Even if it's just once a week, go play cards, do something, whatever you enjoy. Walk around the block with a group of people. The next thing, and, and this is, you know, these seem sort of vague, but they're intentionally vague because they have to fit you. The next one is stay engaged. So participating in structured activities is exercise for the mind. People always ask me, hey, you know, I, half of my work is in Alzheimer's. They say, what can I do to keep my brain healthy? Well, it turns out physical exercise and structured activities are better than any of the currently available um, medications, okay? So structured activities can be something as simple as, you know, a group activity that sort of has a time that it starts and a time that it ends, right? Because otherwise things get fuzzy in your mind. I mean, if they're intellectually engaging, they're even better. Conversation, that discourse, that back and forth, is lubrication for your brain. And so all of these things are really important and you can do them socially, okay? Uh, people, you know, join lectures. They, um, you know, go to things that are interactive like debate groups. Um, people who uh, have a faith, you know, they go to church and they read scripture or they're, you know, they're in prayer groups. I mean, whatever fits your life uh, is, is a structured activity, build it in. Sleep. This is so incredibly important that I, I always start with sleep because if they say, what are the three big health behaviors, right? There's sleep, exercise, and diet, right? It turns out you can exercise like crazy, you can eat right, but if you don't sleep, these are less relevant. The other two are less relevant. Sleep is sort of the one that rules them all. Try to give yourself an eight hour sleep opportunity. So this is really, this, this sounds like weasel words, but let me tell you what I mean. With Parkinson's and just getting older and aches and pains and disruptions in the home, it's hard for any of us to consistently get eight hours of sleep. So all we're saying to people is get into a routine where you sort of wind down at night. You're not drinking caffeine or taking stimulants. You're not getting rowdy right before bed. You're not drinking alcohol because that interrupt sleep. You're sort of winding down in those last hour or two before bed. That's your routine, right? Turning, dimming the lights. And then you get in bed at a time that allows you to be in bed for at least eight hours before your alarm goes off or before you have to get up. So that's all we're saying is just allow yourself every night that eight hour sleep opportunity. And believe it or not, if you do that consistently, if that becomes your habit, your body will eventually learn to sleep more efficiently. You know, with Parkinson's, it'll never probably be perfect, but that gives you the best opportunity, okay? Now, exercise and physical activity has been shown to benefit uh, mental health and decrease stress. That's we're talking a little bit more about. So aerobic exercise in Parkinson's, this is the best studied. And right now looks like it probably has the most pound for pound benefit, okay? There's at least, this is, I looked last year, there's at least 18 high quality scientific articles specifically on aerobic or what we call cardiovascular exercise in Parkinson's. And let me just tell you what it's shown. We know that it helps the movement symptoms directly. There is a strong suspicion that it's one of the only things known currently to slow disease progression. And it improves attention, processing speed, reaction time, executive function, and language. That's been proven in studies. This isn't me just speculating. It's been proven to uh, enhance these cognitive domains in Parkinson's. It does it, does it in non-Parkinson's too. So if you have a spouse who's willing to exercise with you, all the better. And mostly these are people on treadmills, walking, stationary bike. That's what the studies show. But frankly, anything that gets your heart rate up and gets you moving is cardiovascular, okay? And then 
to, to the point about depression, which is the point of this talk, it's been shown to reduce the severity of depression in Parkinson's exercise. So this is one-stop shopping. Now, uh, the other thing that I, I wanna talk about, and this is, this is less what you can do, but more what you should seek. Let's say you're doing all these things pretty well and you're still pretty miserable. Either you can't experience pleasure, or you feel sad, and you, you think you might have one of these depressive conditions. Go to your doctor. And we have so many antidepressant options, I couldn't even name them all before our time ran out today. So there's almost always an antidepressant that will fit you. And I always tell people, be patient, because with all these options, the one I choose might not work well with your, your personal chemistry. But if if you're patient and you work with your doctors, we'll find the one that gives you the best benefit with the fewest side effects, okay? And this treatment algorithm, I just, the reason I want to put it up here is not to have you memorize all these details that we're, you know, doctors are still struggling to memorize, but it's to tell you that there's always hope. We have so many things we can do, so many options, so many combinations that, you know, even if we can't cure, you know, the Parkinson's itself, we can absolutely find relief for your depression because we have an algorithm that, you know, goes on for days and, and we will find relief for your mood. Now, let me talk just a little bit about other mood and emotional disturbances in Parkinson's. So these are things that you could have depression and then have these things too, so they can occur together. We call that comorbid or co-occurrence of these two disorders, or you could be fine. Your mood can be fine and you could have these other disorders. Okay. So let's just talk a little bit about them. So you, you sort of get a sense of what they are. So the first is apathy. Okay. So apathy can look like depression and depression can look like apathy and depressed people can be apathetic. Right. But we think the conditions are different. Okay. Different mechanism, different treatments are necessary. So let me show you first how they overlap and how they're different, okay? So the overlapping symptoms are this inability to sort of experience pleasure, okay? When you're apathetic, you don't experience pleasure. But remember, I said when you're depressed, you usually have a reduced ability to enjoy things, okay? Energia, that means low energy. Both states have low energy. And especially in apathy, you're less likely to even initiate activities. You're apathetic. You don't care. You're less physically active. You're moving less in both conditions. And you're just less enthusiastic overall. So those are the overlapping. Now, here's how you differentiate them. The guys with depression or the women with depression, they're not, you know, they're going to sometimes be sad. They're going to feel guilty. They're going to have negative emotions. Apathetic people don't necessarily have negative emotions. They're not bothered. In fact, most of the time when you have an apathetic person, it's the caregiver or family that's upset because they're like, all he does is sit on the couch. He doesn't do anything, okay? And so this emotional indifference is really the hallmark of apathy. And again, the reason this is important is you can throw antidepressants at somebody with apathy and it doesn't really help. You're just exposing them to side effects of a medication that's very unlikely to help. And in fact, if it helps the apathy, you've probably misdiagnosed someone with depression with apathy. And so you to distinguish these is very important because apathy, at least right now, the evidence says that it needs different treatments. And let me tell you what those are. So instead of antidepressants, we think that acetylcholinesterase inhibitors particularly one called rivastigmine that goes by the brand name Exelon, it has shown efficacy in improving apathy, okay? The other one, and this is in certain cases, usually post deep brain stimulation, is dopamine agonists, okay? Uh, the medications that you use to improve movement might also help with apathy that occurs after uh, deep brain stimulation. That one's a little less certain. The other thing that's really helpful though to apathy is participation in structured activities and socialization. So a lot of those things I said that you can do for depression are also helpful in apathy, but here's the, here's the sort of trick to that. The apathetic individual and the depressive individual is, is not gonna wanna participate in these activities. So you're gonna have to give them a little push or encouragement to motivate them to do these things. And then here's one that I think 
uh, we don't talk about much at all. And fortunately in Parkinson's, um, uh, you know, we do have treatments for this, but it's called pseudo bulbar affect. Uh, and sometimes it's referred to as emotional incontinence. And it basically, it's an emotional expression that's involuntary and often uncontrollable, okay? Almost like a hiccup. You know how sometimes you get the hiccups and you can't stop? With pseudobulbar affect or emotional incontinence, you might start laughing or crying and be unable to stop. And so I'll just tell you a, a really quick story. I had this woman that I, I worked with, she had Parkinson's, and she'd come into my office and sometimes she'd start laughing, not necessarily because I was telling jokes, but she'd start laughing. And I usually do hour long visits. If she started laughing, sometimes she'd laugh until the end of the visit. She'd literally be so tired and out of breath. And it was hard to talk to her because she couldn't stop laughing. Um, so it can be really distressing. And if you're crying, you can imagine if you're out in public, it can be really embarrassing, or I guess the laughing could be embarrassing, but these can be a big problem. And like I said, it's involuntary, uncontrollable. And uh, oftentimes people will say, you know, I, I've never been a big crier, but if I see a, a Hallmark commercial uh, on the TV, I'll start crying and I'll cry for 15 minutes. And so it turns out that you can treat these uh, with low dose uh, antidepressants, uh, sometimes those are helpful, but the only really FDA approved treatment uh, uh, for this condition is something called Nudexta, okay? And it's available um, through prescription, and it's probably uh, something that's worth trying for people who have, uh, you know, uh, severe symptoms like this. And, it, you know, the, the antidepressants, if you also have other conditions, that might warrant antidepressants. Sometimes those might be the first things you choose, even though it's an off-label use, simply because you're getting a two for one. If you're using it for another indication, then why do two things for a condition that can be captured by one medication? But uh, again, if it's just the pseudobulbar affect, Nudexta is the brand name and dextromorphan uh, quinidine is the combination treatment. And it uh, has pretty good evidence of efficacy and is usually well tolerated, okay? Now, I promised you guys that even though I had to wrap up a little early, I'd leave some time for questions. So let me stop there. I know that's a mouthful, but hopefully that gives you a sense of how mood can be affected in Parkinson's. Thank you. Um, so there was a question about your slide where you had the red to the left um, and the blue to the right and the indicators of the onset of Parkinson's. And they wanted to know why did the blue lines go down gradually? Um, is there a point in time when the onset of depression is less likely? So that's a great question. So, well, really, um, and this is sort of uh, in the, um, the nuance in the methodology of the study. These bars represent the first onset of a mood disorder. So for instance, you know, people who have major depression might have recurrent episodes of depression. And this figure only shows the very first one. So the reason it's going down is because many of the people who had the earlier episodes are now taken out of the sample because they've already had their depressive episode. So by the end, if half of people have already had a depressive episode, because I said about 50% will have depression, there's not many people left to populate the right tail of the graph. Gotcha, that makes total sense. And then someone wanted to know if you could briefly address the comorbid anxiety and depression a little bit more. I know we're gonna talk about that later, but I, I think that it would be helpful to kind of delve into that a little bit. That's actually, whoever asked that, I wanna start by thanking them because that's actually my favorite question. That's the question that's gonna to lead to my next research grant. But uh, not just in Parkinson's, but in general, and but especially in Parkinson's, anxiety and, and depression occur together. And in Parkinson's, we think maybe 80, 90% of the time, the two go together. And we think that could be because of shared mechanism, meaning that there's an overlap in the biological cause of the two symptoms, anxiety and depression. And sometimes um, we can successfully treat both with the same medication. So it turns out that for most anxiety disorders, antidepressants are the first line treatment. And so you can already see that would make you suspicious of overlap, but we're trying to understand that a little bit better so that we can develop better treatments when they occur together. 
And there was a question about, oh, now they're all coming in. <laughs> what are the side effects of medication for apathy that you spoke of? Yeah, so that's a, another really good question. So let's start with the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors uh, like rivastigmine. So rivastigmine um, is a medication that um, you know, can cause uh, nausea or vomiting. Actually, it's pretty common if you take it orally. It's available in a patch as well. That's probably the most common uh, side effect. It can also prolong the electrical activity that repolarizes your heart muscle. And so sometimes in people who are on a combination of medications that do that, you might need to check an EKG just to make sure you don't prolong that repolarization of the heart too long. That's not a, a, a major problem, but it's something that is often monitored. So that's the first category of treatment. The second one, the dopamine agonists, uh, they have a host of potential side effects, but you know, at the same time, they're usually going to be helping your movement. And so um, dopamine agonists sometimes can cause swelling in your lower extremities. Uh, sometimes dopamine agonists can be associated with behavioral uh, side effects, but by and large, they're also fairly well tolerated, at least in people who have uh, you know, less advanced Parkinson's. Okay. And I know you have, they want to bring you back. I know you're coming back for the anxiety and um, other mood uh, disorders that we didn't get to discuss because um, there's so much that we could cover. In fact, there was some questions about the care partners experiencing anxiety and that's a whole nother talk in and of itself. Um, there was one, just a clarification in regards to pseudobulbar effect, because we don't get a chance to discuss that very often. And just the clarification that that actually is what causes the social distress and embarrassment. That is not the trigger. No. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, let me, uh, so uh, I think what's really important is this pseudobulbar affect is a neurological condition and it happens uh, more frequently in Parkinson's and other neurological disorders than it does in people who don't have neurological disorders. I've seen it in stroke victims. I've seen it in people with Parkinson's and ALS and you name it. And what happens is for whatever reason, your, your control over your emotions is not as uh, secure as it normally would be. Because, you know, sometimes you get angry and you want to cry or shout or whatever, but you can keep the brakes on. With the pseudobulbar affect, something that's touching leaks out your eyes right away. And the other really conspicuous thing that I didn't mention, and I think this is a great point of clarification, is that I've seen people cry for 15 minutes in my office. And if I ask them, are you sad? They tell me no. So that's the other really important part here is that the the emotional expression is not necessarily consistent with the mood state. So I have people who are laughing hysterically and they're not happy and nothing's funny. And I have people who are crying and nothing's making them sad or upset. And it's uh, like I said, it's like a hiccup. You know, I, I don't know why I'm doing it, but I can't stop. Right. And in regards to the, the major depression, and you mentioned uh, suicide ideation and all that, is there a higher risk of suicide in people with Parkinson's versus their age-matched peers outside of Parkinson's? That's a great question. And so, and actually my group um, just published on that, I think two years ago, and we actually looked at it across multiple studies. So that's, you know, sort of a meta-analysis of the existing literature over the last 10 or 20 years. And so again, I can't tell you with hundred percent confidence, but I can tell you with pretty good confidence that we do think that people with Parkinson's tend to have suicidal thoughts, maybe a little more commonly than people who don't have Parkinson's, but at least in, in the sort of um, accumulated evidence across multiple studies, it is not clear that they actually commit or attempt more often. And so that, I guess that's mixed news. So you think about it more, but you don't necessarily attempt suicide more often. So uh, either way though, what we tell people is that any of those thoughts should immediately come to the attention of, of healthcare providers because they're, they're definitely something we can improve. And there was an interesting question, and I, I know you have to go, so let me get the last one. Sorry, everyone. And you've got such great questions. But there was a question around um, maybe use of an SSRI or SNRI uh, starting at the same time as starting levodopa treatment. Is that something that would ever be considered? I am sure not. Everybody is not express, experiencing depression, but would they ever consider that as a treatment protocol? 
I'm going to answer this in a really muddy way. Um, <laughs> so, so first of all, there, there's no evidence that whether in Parkinson's or um, uh, outside of Parkinson's, that antidepressants are prophylactic, that they necessarily prevent the onset of a mood change. Now, it might be that they do. There's just no good evidence that they do. And so, I mean, because if there was, we just start putting it in the water, right? Because most of the new ones are pretty benign. But in Parkinson's, what's really interesting is that they've done studies where they look back before people even knew they had Parkinson's and people who are on in particular, a certain type of antidepressant called a tricyclic antidepressant by the name of nortriptyline. It seems like that made their initial presentation of Parkinson's less severe. And they had a longer time until they needed treatment compared to people who weren't on that particular antidepressant. And so while I can tell you that, no, we wouldn't recommend if you're not depressed, we don't recommend that you start one. I wouldn't be completely surprised if that changes at some point in the future, given some of these studies that show people who had just been on one early tended to have a milder start to their Parkinson's. Awesome. All right. Well, I know we, we have to let you go and we appreciate you giving your time. Um, so I'm going to, uh, welcome everyone to give you the wave of gratitude and thank you so much for this. And Dr. Pontone, if you need to hop off, you can. The rest of you, I just thank want to you. give you, you, thank you so much. A few closing statements. I know some of you are asking about the recording. Yes, it will be up with the slides. Um, probably around tomorrow. Um, we do have a follow-up program that's coming up regarding anxiety and other behavioral disturbances, October 6th. Um, it should be listed on the website, so you can go ahead and register for that and mark your calendars. If you want to go back and review this and share it with others, please do so. Um, I know it was full of really good information. We didn't get through all of the questions. Um, maybe we'll have a little more time during the next one, or there'll be some merging of some of that information in the follow-up. So thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you have a good rest of your Thursday and we'll see you next time. Bye.